can begin live stream at any time. Excellent. Sergeant, we're live and streaming okay. now. At this point, if we can begin our recording, I have my recording going. Let's get the clouds going, and I'm going to get kicked. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Chair. We're ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant Arms. Good morning, everyone. As we gavel in our hearing for this morning, let me start off by saying we are close to getting to Thanksgiving. So if I do not see you at the end, have a blessed, safe, healthy holiday for everyone as we enter into a, uh, another strange time here in New York City. But we, as always, we will get through it. But good morning and welcome to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Today is Friday, November 20th, 2020. And my name is Paul Barone. I have the privilege of chairing this committee. I'd like to extend my thanks to my fellow committee members. As of now, right now, I have Councilmember Mark ja, Jonai, Peter Fu, and Keith Powers with us, um, as well as the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation for coming together for today's hearing. The purpose today is to discuss the impact that COVID-19 pandemic has had on businesses at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, how businesses at the Navy Yard have pivoted to PPE manufacturing, and what has been done by the Navy Yard businesses to bring these essential materials to those of us who need them most. Last June, the committee had the opportunity and it was a wonderful one. And I thank everyone for joining us as we toured the Navy Yard along with our colleagues at EDC and took the ferry from down from City Hall and did a, one of our uh, things that we've been as a standard is going to the sites for committee hearings, which was wonderful. And hopefully we get to do that again, maybe this June. Uh, and it was a pleasure to see firsthand the various businesses and education centers available at the yard. From WeWork to Dock 72 to the STEAM Center, the Navy Yard is a gem for opportunity and talent in the industrial, technological, and manufacturing industries, as well as a hub for specialty grocers such as Wegmans and Russ and Dorms. At a hearing held by this committee in January 2019, we also had the opportunity to discuss much of the rich 220-year history of the Navy Yard as it has evolved from the early years as a naval shipbuilding yard into one of the city's most well-run engines for economic development. Nearly all of the Navy Yard space has been leased over the last decade, and so the Navy Yard Development Corporation announced its $2.5 billion master plan in just 2018 to expand the physical space at the yard in order to meet the ongoing demand for new tenants, to utilize the innovation space, and continue to offer opportunities in manufacturing, technology, and industry right here in New York City. The goals outlined in the 2018 master plan were in brief to create 10,000 new jobs by 2020 and add 5.1 million square feet of manufacturing space to the yard to employ around 30,000 people by 2030. We on the, on the committee commend the Navy Yard Development Corporation and the laudable goals set forth in its master plan. We hope to hear the progress of those goals during today's hearing, and we'd also like to receive regular updates on the progress of the master plan. This is why I have sponsored the bill before the committee today. Intro 1839 would require the Naval Yard Development Corporation to submit an annual report to the mayor and city council on the progress of achieving the goals of its master plan. As stewards of the general welfare of the city, its workforce and its budget, the bill is designed to provide regular updates to the city's elected officials on what progress is being made in this $2.5 billion undertaking at a Navy Yard, which is under a 99-year lease as tenants to the city of New York. We applaud the Navy Yard businesses for their hard work throughout this pandemic and recognize that perhaps as a result of the ongoing crisis, the goals set forth in the original master plan might be somewhat delayed or changed. Nonetheless, we wish to discuss the progress of the master plan whether there is anything we as a council can do to aid in its progress and success, as we have seen. And before we turn to testimony from the Navy Yard, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Economic Development Committee staff, who is, as my second family, we love them all, and they have made us 
entire council is shining together. My legislative council, Alex Polanoff, my policy analyst, Emily Forgione, and finance analysis, Aliyah Ali, as along with my chief of staff, Jonathan Shug, my legislative director, Ahmed Nazar, and also uh, my entire staff for working with them. I'll now turn over to our moderator, committee counsel, Alex Polanoff, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ballone. Uh, I am Alex Polanoff, counsel to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify in order. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony will be the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, David Ehrenberg. Brooklyn Navy Yard Chief Development Officer, Johanna Greenbaum, will also be available for questioning. I will call on you shortly when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the Brooklyn Navy Yard who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? President Ehrenberg. Yes, I do. Chief Development Officer Greenbaum. Yes, I do. Thank you. President Ehrenberg, you may begin your testimony. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, and Chairman Vallone and fellow council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which I'll refer to as BMYDC or the Navy Yard kind of interchangeably throughout this uh, testimony. Uh, you may recall that we last appeared before the committee two years ago to discuss how BMYDC had become a national model of urban revitalization and economic and workforce development. Um, as was noted, we had you out to the yard last June. We would love to have you all out um, this June if a vaccine is widely available, which um, seems more and more likely. Um, you know, when, when last we spoke with you both those times, uh, we could hardly have envisioned the uh, environment within which we now operate and we've been operating in for the last nine months or so. Um, just a little bit of background, the Navy Yard is a mission-driven not-for-profit that serves as the real estate developer and property manager of the physical Navy Yard on behalf of its owner, the City of New York. Our mission, put simply, is to preserve quality jobs, grow the city's modern manufacturing sector, and perhaps most critically, connect local, the local community with the economic opportunity and resources of the Yard. During this testimony, I will first discuss our ongoing work in response to the pandemic, and then we'll discuss the progress that we've made on our master plan. Since March, the Navy Yard and many of its tenants have played a significant role in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. While this has been an incredibly challenging time, it has shown us and the city at large the value and impact of the Navy Yard operating model. Our response to the pandemic and ensuing economic downturn can be divided into three areas. First, our work to help pivot, tenants pivot to manufacturing of personal protective equipment, or PPE. Second, our work with our tenants to help them survive this difficult time. And third, our continued commitment to the surrounding community. Um, as to PPE production, as many of you probably know, the yard became a central hub of PPE production in the early days of the pandemic, when the city faced shortages of everything from face shields to medical gowns and ventilators. The response and ingenuity of our tenants to this crisis was truly inspiring. Not since the Navy closed the facility in 1966 has the importance of local production been so plain for our city. Very early in the crisis, we began working with City Hall, DOH, HAC, and the EDC to identify critical PPE shortages for which the international supply chains had frozen and that we believed we could manufacture at the yard. Ultimately, the yard became the central hub of the local production efforts producing nearly 10 million units of PPE and more than 26,000 gallons of hand sanitizer. What I most want to communicate today, and this is a little bit hard to explain, something, um, but is that it was no coincidence that these activities were centered at the yard. 
It was a result of the basic operating model and the public and nonprofit stewardship of the property over decades that created the environment where this was possible. It's not just the fact that we've retained manufacturers at the yard that made this possible though. It's the connective tissue, the social infrastructure that BMYDC as a nonprofit landlord has created that allowed, that allowed us to so quickly work with our tenants to establish these production lines. While tenants manufa manufactured PPE across about, across about a dozen products, I'll focus on just three today, face shields, medical gowns, and ventilators. Within days of the onset of the pandemic, DOH identified these three items as the most critical shortages that local production could help fill. To take the example of face shields, that production was identified as an immediate need on a Thursday call in mid-March between us, DOH, and HHC and EDC. That afternoon, the Navy Yard security team picked up a sample of the product that DOH needed. And actually, we picked it up from the apartment building of a local doctor who had um, taken it home uh, after one of his shifts. And we delivered it to a consortium of tenants we had identified as uniquely set up to produce these products. By Saturday, so three days later, uh, a prototype of the product was delivered to DOH, and by Sunday, the design was approved. Monday and Tuesday were spent sourcing needed materials and establishing the production lines, and by Wednesday, the assembly line was up and running. Uh, by Thursday and Friday, uh, the assembly line was producing tens of thousands of face shields every day. Uh, that identification of our tenants really, again, was only because we, we knew who they were, we knew what products they had, uh, what technology, what equipment they had, and we were able to match um, a couple tenants together in order to get that assembly line up, something that would have been much more difficult had we not been so intimately involved with our tenants. Simultaneously, we were working with the EDC to establish a procurement process, because of course the city had never done anything like this before. And it's a very important point to stress that our tenants did what entrepreneurs do best. They identified a problem and immediately got to work. In many cases, it wasn't until weeks after they started production and had been spending their own capital that the contracts were actually signed. While more technical in nature was a similar story for medical gowns, this time our security team actually drove four hours upstate to hand deliver samples of gowns that DOH needed to one of our tenants sample makers who had relocated with his family um, to upstate. Within a week, two of our tenants had partnered to cut the required patterns of small, medium, and large, and develop what's called a tech pack that lays out all of the material requirements and other specifications for the product. A few days later, over half a dozen companies across the yard had assembly lines up and running to, to produce these gowns. And that pattern and the open source tech package developed at the yard were then shared via EDC with producers across the city who used them as the basis for their own production lines. Finally, as our hospital sy systems grappled with a terrifying possibility of widespread ventilator shortage shortages, a fear that thankfully never fully materialized, a group of high-tech product design companies based at New Lab, our incubator for such businesses, sprang into action. Working with a manufacturer in Long Island City, they designed and manufactured a ventilator model that could be produced in a matter of weeks, the timeline that the crisis in New York demanded, but that could not possibly be matched by the existing supply chains. And again, this is a matter of the ecosystem that we've developed. We have become a central hub really across the country and in many ways worldwide for high-tech product design companies. Uh, and it was these companies based in New Lab, but partnering with other companies outside New Lab that were able in a matter of a couple of weeks to develop the design for an open source ventilator, something that you know, boggles the mind and which you could not have simply turned to any old product company uh, and asked them to do. It really is the ecosystem and community that we've built over time uh, that allowed this to happen. Each individual story of a tenant pivoting to PPE production was heartening and played a real, a real role in keeping our nurses, doctors, EMTs, and other first responders safe. But the fact that so much of this activity occurred in our tenant businesses, and they were the first out of the gate, was not a surprise. For decades, we had been building a community of next generation manufacturers and produ providing the means for them to collaborate with each other and the city when the need arose. Creating this community of manufacturing tenants and an environment where they can collaborate certainly is not rocket science. However, it does take real dedication and stewardship over the course of years and decades. The importance of this work is clear to us every day, given the diversification of the city's economy we allow and the thousands of local residents who have access to high quality jobs at the yard. However, 
we believe that the last nine months has been a real public statement about the importance of the yard and local production for the city as a whole. Now, moving on to um, how we've supported our tenants through this crisis, um, we've, had, we've had to ensure that our tenant businesses can get through this extremely difficult financial uh, period. As a landlord, we've worked with every single tenant who has identified a financial hardship, which is many of them, uh, to defer and abate significant amounts of their rent. Our rent deferral and abatement program is, to our knowledge, the most generous in the city among commercial landlords. In addition to rent flexibility, as part of our model, we have an in-house business support services team that provides our tenants with various forms of support to help them scale and grow. Throughout the pand pandemic, that team has led our efforts to help yard companies stabilize themselves and cope with the financial challenges of the, of the downturn. And, and they've led more than 60 trainings and technical assistance sessions in recent months. Um, obviously the payroll protection program or PPE looms very large uh, for small businesses in getting through this pandemic. And our tenants saw the same problems with the first round of the federal PPP program that were well documented in the media. We were only aware of eight tenants who successfully received a PPE loan in the first round. Before the second round was even announced, we developed a comprehensive program to ensure that our tenants would get loans in the second round. We secured a funding commitment from the Urban Investment Group at Goldman Sachs with their lending partner, Pursuit Lending, and developed partnerships with Piedmont and Carver National Bank to assist yard tenants in securing these loans. We also provided additional training and technical assistance as needed to help companies apply successfully. These partnerships translated in, into every single eligible tenant at the Navy Yard that we were aware of receiving a PPP loan. That's more than 130 in, in total. So we went from eight in the first round to 130 in the second round. We know that the pandemic hit communities of color the hardest in the city. Acknowledging that reality, combined with, the with addressing this summer's nationwide movement regarding social and racial justice, reaffirmed our commitment to our minority community, particularly the Yard's Black-owned businesses. For the past three months, we've surveyed the needs of MWBEs, and particularly MBE companies, to help address the systemic barriers minority entrepreneurs face. And this is an evolving area of work for us, but immediately we've launched an MWBE, MBE programming that includes a quarterly small business education series that sets MBE tenants up to move past $1 million in revenue and grow their workforces. In addition, we've created leadership and networking opportunities with partners like General Assembly and have helped MBE tenants access grants and other programs through local partners such as LISC. Um, we've also, as I said, kind of redoubled our efforts or um, or refocused our attention on our local community. Um, it goes without saying that our local, uh, our focus on ensuring economic opportunity for our neighborhood has become ever more important. Uh, it's something that we are focused on every day um, uh, of the year, uh, throughout the years. It doesn't, you know, the pandemic has not fundamentally changed that, but it certainly has sharpened that focus. And in August, again, to address the systemic barriers that uh, minorities and particularly uh, Black entrepreneurs face in launching and growing businesses, we announced plans to develop an equity incubator, a cutting edge space designed to support Black and Brown entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses in their efforts to create, develop, and grow their companies. Through an initial $2 million investment of capital from the city council and operating from support from SBS, we're now in a position to move this project forward. And we thank the council and administration for their support to date. Um, what, what's happened in that is that we've recently released an RFEI um, to, to find an operator for that incubator. Um, and we will be getting responses back in January. It was intentionally a very open RFEI, seeking ideas from social entrepreneurs about what they believed would most help um, MBE businesses. Um, we have our own ideas, but we really want to hear from, um, from other organizations, other nonprofits, and like I said, other social entrepreneurs um, to get the best ideas out there before we made a selection. We've also recommitted to our work with our employment center, which trains and places local residents into jobs at the yard. The center connected a record-breaking 589 people to jobs in fiscal year 19, marking a 28% increase from FY18, which had increased significantly from FY17. Um, of those, 90% of the hires were uh, Brooklyn residents, and more than a third lived in public housing. Approximately a fifth experienced long-term unemployment, and another fifth were previously incarcerated or convicted. 
Not surprisingly, the focus of our workforce development team has changed dramatically since the economic downturn began. They focused on placing local residents into jobs in those companies that are hiring because of the PPE production. Um, but acknowledging that job companies are hiring fewer people than they were a year ago, uh, we've also uh, refocused on efforts, our efforts on developing innovative models um, that can potentially be um, replicated outside the yard. Uh, most recently, um, as our internship numbers dropped during the summer, we continued our internship program, but we developed a new, more intensive model for an internship to employment program with CUNY that we're hoping to expand beyond the yard. Uh, moving to our master plan, um, the Navy Yard has grown dramatically in recent years. Just before COVID set in, we had reached about 12,000 jobs on site, doubling the roughly 6,000 jobs of seven years ago. And based on projects that we have recently completed, we were projected to reach 20,000 jobs within the next two years or so. Our master plan is a bold vision of how to continue this growth past the, that 20,000 jobs by building new modern manufacturing buildings, the likes of which have never been built in urban America. This master plan, when fully executed, will create an additional 10,000 jobs, bringing us to a total of 30,000. The first step in this master plan is to establish a special zoning district for the yard through a ULERP. The land use changes needed in this ULERP would be comparatively limited, but essential for our continued growth, given that the underlying manufacturing zoning has not been changed since the 1960s. The major land use actions we plan to request are to limit the amount of parking and loading bays required. Modern manufacturers simply don't require the same amount of truck access compared to tra traditional manufacturers and warehouses, uh, warehouse uses that were the norm when the existing M zoning was created. We will also seek use changes to allow us to locate more academic facilities on site. Our goal is to create more spaces like the Brooklyn Steam Center, the CTE High School that we developed and opened last year, as well as community facilities such as Brooklyn College's Fierstein, Fierstein Film School, which is on the Steiner Studios uh, film studio. We believe that these schools and their students benefit enormously by being co-located co with related industries, and we would very much like to see more such partnerships. COVID has slowed the progress of this rezoning as we halted our work on, um, on the zoning change text at the beginning of the pandemic due to very real budget concerns at the yard. We're now prepared to restart this work and we're speaking with the administration to determine if there is still time to finalize our work, certify and complete the Euler process under this administration. Lastly, as members of the committee may know, we hold quarterly meetings with our elected officials, local elected officials to provide updates on our work and we've continued to do so throughout the pandemic. It's an opportunity for us to share plans and continue our partnerships that have given us such deep roots in the surrounding Brooklyn communities. This close relationship with our local elected officials and stakeholders is central to our model, and I personally speak with most of them quite regularly. We understand that intro 1839 would require the yard to provide an annual report on its activities and progress on the master plan. We see our quarterly meetings as a more frequent and frankly more effective way to keep our stakeholders updated. So while we support the notion of BNYDC keeping our stakeholders fully updated, we don't believe that a bill is actually needed and that it would in fact be counterproductive to our local relationships. As, we, as me, these meetings have proven useful, we would much prefer to continue this model of updating our stakeholders rather than a formal, formal written document. I would also note that we are more than happy to come before this committee um, as, you know, as frequently as is reasonable um, to, to continue to update you. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity to discuss the mission and work of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we're certainly happy to answer any questions that the committee would have. Thank you, President Ehrenberg. We'll now turn it over to questions from the chair. Uh, panelists from the Navy Yard, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. And a reminder to Chair Vallone that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourselves during this period. Uh, Chair Vallone, uh, you may begin. Always a dangerous skill that you're giving us. Have the control over muting and unmuting. You sure you want to do that? <laughs> it's only. <laughs> I, I have failed every general behavior class in my classes going up to law school for being a little bit too excited in my class. <laughs> so, David and Joanna, welcome. And as always, we are big fans of all the work you were doing. So, and we also thank you for the tour. You know, this, this committee 
really try to go to places to visualize. I'm, a, I'm old school like that. I like to see the place and understand it, and it helps us to formulate uh, and, and better know these relationships that you've been building. So we thank you for that. Um, the hearing, I, I really just want to give you that additional platform with this virtual hearing to let everyone know that work that you've been doing. And on this platform, you can reach so many more people of, of how critical the role was of the transition period during those scary times where families like ours were struck with COVID in March and didn't have any place to turn. There was these great stories that have emerged through the private partnerships and non-for-profits and EDC and Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and how they stepped up. So we thank you for that. And honestly, you guys stepped up more than any of the city agencies did. Right? We, we've learned that the speed at which you and your partners work uh, were probably the lifeline for the city. So from behalf of all of that, we say thank you. How do you see the, I guess with the, how you transitioned in March and now what's happening today um, and whether we're, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so whether we're in a second wave, whether it's coming, I mean, obviously a lot of states seem to be worse off than we were, but we, I believe we've done our part to keep the numbers down and I'm hopeful we're gonna be confident that that takes its course over the winter. But if things were to continue to get worse, how, how do you see that your position now to handle the, to that second transition that may be necessary? Um, so I, I think we learned a lot um, and um, you know, our companies responded extraordinarily quickly, but I think next time, presuming that the input supply chain holds up, they could respond even more quickly um, in a second wave. At this point, none of our companies are currently producing PPE for the city anymore. Um, those products that I described went through a procurement process with EDC and were ultimately delivered to DOH's warehouse and then distributed to public and private hospitals. Um, and that work has stopped. Our tenants are still producing a lot of PPE for the general public, um, and in, in, in at least one occasion, um, one case producing for FEMA as well. So Dave, let's just um, stop there for a minute because that's, that's important. So you've got to the point where the city is no longer requiring PPE and now you're doing it more for individual companies or groups or hospitals that are asking for it? That's right. Um, our understanding is that, you know, the supply chains have um, freed back up and DOH has been building up a strategic reserve of the products that we were we were building um, and that they're comfortable with where they stand. I certainly can't speak to the to that, but um, we, we have stopped producing for for the city. Um, there, our tenants are producing for a very wide range of, um, of types of uses. So um, I've not personally ridden in an Uber uh, for quite a while, uh, but there are now separators between the drivers and passengers. One of our tenants is, is building those and in, has installed over 10,000 such separators. So it's quite varied. And again, entrepreneurs doing what entrepreneurs do, which is see a need and, and address it. Um, but we are working with EDC to kind of put together a playbook um, which would include the technical materials that our tenants developed. Um, so that tech pack, which literally goes through, you know, how you stitch the gown together, um, what products you use, the water um, repellency of the material, et cetera, et cetera, so that it's all in, in one place. Um, if we need it in the next couple of months, obviously we would have it. The idea is if we needed it in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we would have it there as well, um, then as well. Um, obviously the procurement process was also something that um, was, I would say a challenge and it was a challenge for our tenants, but having worked, I've never actually worked for a city agency. I've only ever worked for, for EDC or, um, or the Navy Yard, but I've wor worked kind of in a, in a, in a city function for, um, going on 20 years now, um, I was really quite impressed by the speed with which DOH, EDC, HHC responded to this. Was it perfect? Probably not. Um, or our tenants sometimes itching for their PO to be signed? Absolutely. Um, but given the truly extraordinary challenges um, of that period and the hours you know, we at the Navy Yard were working and all of our fellows, uh, um, public servants in the agencies were working. The, the procurement process I thought was actually quite laudable, but presumably next time it would, you know, we would just 
open the page that of the book to that and we'd be able to get a PO very quickly these tenants. And, that, and that's what our hope is. So, so that you have already forged that path and we have had hearings with directly just with EDC since they really uh, were the stimulus that created most of this. Yeah. You know? And now we hear these relationships like yours and throughout the city. In my eyes, I, I do have that comfort of knowing that it, the faults are being turned on very quickly. Um, but, you know, we as council members have districts and lines, you know, I'm staring at City MD on the corner and once again, there's a daily line on the corner. So uh, we get the calls and, and folks are nervous. So when yep. we hear that, we're a little less nervous because we know that the capacity is there to be turned on if DOH or any of our hospital groups need that. So that that is a, a, a relief. Listen, if the hearing at least brings out that, at least it gives the council members who are here by the way, let me just re-say which council members have joined us. So before I had said that council members Joe and I, Cooley, and Powers, we're also joined by council members Lewis, Lander, Barron, Nichaka, and I believe council member Levin, who's, who's uh, the host district for the community always come on with some questions. And as always, I get to my council members um, pretty quickly. So what I'm going to do is just, um, I will, there's a lot there, but I always like to give the council members lives are just as busy as everyone else and we give them a chance to do their questions. But what the secondary part of the hearing, and David, I wanted to just bring this up right now before we go back to the work that you're doing there, what we may have to do to tweak the master plan, if anything, based on the, the realities of the pandemic and the financial crisis, what we can do to aid and assist, you know, through, through our budgetary and through EDC and through our hearings. Um, but you ended your testimony with with a paragraph that, you know, I, I wear many hats in life. And one of them's a lawyer, one of them's a soccer coach, one is council member, one is a very happy dad and, and father. But of all the hats that I have, you know, if, if, if you were sitting in my chair and you see a bill that's really requiring just that to the landlord of which you are the tenant, um, when I see that paragraph, I, I don't really get happy about it. So it says, we understand that 1839 would require the art to provide an annual report, but we see the meetings as a more frequent and frankly more effective way to keep our stakeholders updated. Well, we are one of the stakeholders and uh, I'm not sure that the city agencies, I'm not sure who's there at the quarterly meeting, but if you're having the quarterly meeting and you're already preparing the document for that, I don't see the onus or the additional level of, of oversight that is going to create a, a less effective way when you're already effectively operating. And this is, this is not bad news. This is good news as to what's happening. And providing either those quarterly and then in a summer, summary annual report over to the committee and the council members that are basically charged with uh, oversight for EDC as landlord of the city doesn't seem to me to re meet that level. What am, what am I missing as to why we couldn't already duplicate the information you're doing that could be sent over to the council? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I would, and, and let me reaffirm what I guess was in the, was also in the, uh, in that paragraph, which is that we certainly are very committed and I think it's a uh, absolute central part of our model to uh, free flow of information and um, and being as transparent as, as possible. I would say I started my career as a community organizer and so uh, really fully believe in, um, in, in the importance of being plain about what you're doing and uh, you may not agree every single time, but sharing the information is critical. Um, and I think that the way I would answer that is um, that the model of the yard is one where uh, we we don't do we don't have annual reports. We don't approach them as formalistic reports. It is really based on relationships. Would one report to the council be the end of that model? No, of course not. Um, but you know. I, the I think the strength of our model is that when one of our local constituents has a question, they pick up the phone and they just call me and I just answer the phone and I answer the question. And it's not 
is not a relationship that's mitigated through an annual report to the city council and, okay, council person, I hear your question, please refer back to the report or something like that. And I've worked and seen other agencies that have more of that formalistic relationship. Would one report radically change it? Perhaps not, but I am a very, all I can say is I'm very um, committed to or attached to that model of if you've got a question, just call me. I'm gonna give you the answer. And David, that model has been a wonderful model. Trust me, there's, there are city agencies that don't function anywhere close to the level of the efficiency that we do. And I think, and I, I've always been a defender of EDC because they are able to operate outside of that bubble that hampers just about every other city agency and works in, in months of delays of red tape. And to, to enhance that, and now to our sake, talking with you, we as the council members must have information to provide and EDC also has resisted and we've gone forward the same thing with just generalization type of data so that we as a council who are the budgetary hand of the city can understand so just like you when we get that phone call we're able to tell our constituents and our committee and our speaker and our mayor what's happening so I really want you to think about that as not as any way to change the format of how you work such a successful uh, nonprofit driven business that is that manager for these tenants that enables them to grow in the times that they need. It is, there's a responsibility there. And I think you kind of nailed it on your second paragraph. I mean, that second paragraph, for those who are just joining in, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is the mission driven, not for profit, that serves as the real estate developer and property manager of the Brooklyn Navy Yard on behalf of its owner, the city of New York. That's it. That's the hearing in a nutshell for those who are. And because of that relationship, um, this is a type of bill that would basically be almost mandatory as far as I haven't done the past because of that. But if I was the lawyer drafting that, that's exactly what would have happened. So we'll go back to how you pivoted through the crisis and all the great work that's going on. And so. Uh, to our legislative council, Alex, do you have a list of the council members who have signed up so that they can speak now? So we can get them on them. I, I do, Chair. Uh, and if you just give me a moment, I'm going to just do a quick procedural bit about the Zoom raise hand function for them, and then I'll turn it over to the uh, okay. to the other members. Um, okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll now call upon members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. And if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once we've called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. First, we will hear from Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Barron. Council Member Lander, you may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Ready for me? Sergeant. We are ready. You are still in the same spot. Do we have to send the rescue squad to you, Brad? You were there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I was looking this morning for like a good shot of the Navy Yard so I could like make a virtual visit to the Navy Yard. But um, I don't know. For for now, I'm so taken with this new Endale Arch in Prospect Park that I'm visiting on a daily basis. But I'll get back to the Navy Yard soon, both virtually and physically. Um, thank you, Chair Vallone, for convening this hearing. And, and thank you to... David and Joanna and your team for uh, for being here. You know, I'm, you guys know I'm just such a big fan of the Navy Yard and the work you do, and so grateful um, for what you have done during the pandemic. But I really agree, like not surprised, like the way that you've built a community of people where economic development is grounded in the shared values that we believe in for it. Um, that something pretty special happens, you know, and and I think that's really significant. Like we all know we need entrepreneurs and we need businesses to generate jobs and economic value. But I, I almost, I wouldn't want to get too philosophical, but I feel like there's sort of the invisible hand idea we inherited from Adam Smith that like, that'll just be like greedy people doing their own thing, but it'll add up to common good somehow. Um, and sometimes that works okay. But I think you guys show in some ways a really profound truth, which is you, if you create the conditions for entrepreneurship and business growth and people to create and create value, um, not only will they do things that sort of achieve those goals of, of priming the economy, 
but it'll be grounded in the values of like sustenance and um, the things people need and rising to challenges together. And boy, uh, what you've done in, in these last few months has really shown that. So thank you for, for that work. Um, I feel like I ask the same question at this hearing every year, uh, which is really not so much about the Navy Yard as about what lessons it shows and teaches for broader city economic development policy. But it feels even more apropos this year as we are starting to think about the kinds of economic recovery that will take us past this COVID crisis. And even if David, as you say, the vaccine, you know, Kanahara is coming before too long, we know that we are in for a devastating economic uh, crisis for a long time to come. And there's gonna be a lot of challenges in recovery. And, you know, you spoke to what you're doing at the yard with rent relief and, you know, all those other things. But I wanna ask you just to think a little about what the Navy Yard teaches the city as a whole for how to overcome those things. So we're going to see a lot of distressed property, for example, in all likelihood. And, you know, we, we're trying to think about what we can do to prevent foreclosures and evictions and make sure that people, businesses can thrive. But I think despite best efforts, there are going to be properties that go into foreclosure, commercial uh, as well as residential, and then plenty of like retail stores. Um, and you know we've seen in past crises, especially after 2008, that plenty of private equity and vulture funds will be out there waiting to scoop up those properties and not at all looking to use them in, in ways that center the goals we have of, of job creation uh, and real value sharing and equity. And I wonder if you see the opportunity for doing something not the same as the Navy Yard, there's nothing that would be the same as the Navy Yard, but inspired by the Navy Yard. Um, that tries to, uh, you know, take that kind of mission-driven nonprofit, be hard to do over a lot of much smaller spaces, but, you know, imagining what it would be to operate, you know, to take a position in retail stores and create opportunities and for arts organizations, as well as for more of the kinds of productive and man light manufacturing. Yeah, I just wonder if you'd offer some thoughts on on what you think the, the lesson shows for what we ought to maybe do as a city. As you know, I've proposed the creation of a land bank, which could not only do residential development, but uh, acquire property to bring it into this model. Um, and I'd just love to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, on, on what we learned from the Navy Yard for facing the, the challenge of economic recovery. Yeah, um, yeah, it's obviously a, a very hard question. Um, the, um, just going back to your general comments, though, um, one quick thing: when you said invisible hand, um, you know, there's a second invisible hand which goes to the model, which is our invisible hand helping companies um, create social good as well. And there certainly are a lot of companies, and I would probably say most of our companies that um, are motivated not just by pure profit um, themselves, but it's also you know that we make it as easy as possible for them when they are looking for interns or hires to find that talent in places where they might, may not look themselves, not because they're bad people, but just because they're busy and they may not have an HR department. And so when they need an intern, absolutely, go to their alma mater for an intern. Again, not because they're a bad person, but it's just the phone number yeah. they have. No, no, my, my only point there was, I think exactly what you were saying, which is when you create conditions that mm -hmm. nurture people's ability to be uh, generous and solidaristic, they're a lot more likely to do so. That's exactly right. And they don't, we, we found that they don't have to be forced to, that you create the conditions and, um, and, and show the value proposition and they, and they do it anyway. Um, in terms of your other question, so I mean, one thing that frankly falls outside the Navy Yard's domain, um, but I think is going to be really important to think through is on retail. We obviously do very, very, very little retail. It's really only as amenity within the yard, but you're obviously going to see an extraordinary amount of dislocation um, in, in retail in large part because of short-term um, cash flow issues. Um, and it may not, uh, may not actually indicate a long-term, whether there's a long-term need for that retail is just a short-term cash is king and a company fails. Um, I believe a lot of that retail will come back. You know, it's kind of a urban economics 101 that retail is dictated not by incentives or anything like that, but by the buying purchasing power of the local community. And if the purchasing power is there, the retail will, will come back. And then you have this core question of who then gets to reopen that business. And when you think about restaurants in particular, 
Um, they're hard to open and easier to reopen because building out a kitchen is extraordinarily expensive and moving into somebody else's kitchen that they lost through a, through a eviction is a lot easier. And I have real concerns that all of the dynamics that you see about, you know, um, communities of color and black owned businesses struggling to find friends and family financing will be extraordinarily powerful in the negative in terms of who gets to reopen those businesses. And there's gonna be some, frankly, there's gonna be some great opportunities in, in residential areas around New York to reopen uh, restaurants in particular, but retail businesses in general. And it's gonna be those individuals who have the liquidity themselves or can turn to friends and family um, to take those opportunities. And I think that's a real area um, that the city should be focused on. Um, and, um, you know, again, outside our domain. Um, more specifically, I, I mean, we're, we're real believers in this idea of identifying and uh, bringing into nonprofit management spaces where the kinds of companies that we, um, that, that we uh, nurture uh, could happen outside of the Navy Yard. Um, I, I will be honest, I think zoning is a, is a blunt tool for those ends. Um, and you know, manufacturing looks like a lot of different things. And to some extent, it's a, you know it when you see it and taking that decision outside of the market and into a nonprofit's hand, I think is the surest way to make sure that, you know, it's a really a manufacturing business and it's not an artisanal pickle maker, which is the example I always use of like, no, we're not having, <laughs> nothing that, that there's anything wrong with artisanal pickle making. We love but, our artisanal pickles, um, but that's not the economic development model exactly. we're trying exactly. primarily to promote. Um, so, you know, that you, I think there is nothing like a nonprofit. We developed years ago the concept of the industrial development fund, which is now housed at EDC. I think that there will be a real opportunity for that to spring into action. Um, and, uh, I think that's, uh, and that was modeled off of the affordable housing programs because yeah. you know, I, I truly believe that like the city doesn't need, uh, I don't know quite know how to phrase this, but like we have, we know how to do this. We've got the best affordable housing development apparatus in the country slash maybe world. And so when we thought about the industrial development fund, we really just said, what happens, what works for affordable housing? Um, and let's just apply it to, to industrial, you know? questions of AMI and all that is a different thing, but the apparatus, the structures that the city has established to make that happen through HDC, H, H, HPD, HDC, the second, third mortgages, the acquisition fund, like you've got, you've got what you need and you can just apply that to in the industrial space. And I think you would very quickly be able to, um, to see some real, real space. And I think there is interest. I mean, there's, there's concern, obviously there's GMDC, there's Evergreen, there are a couple other um, we had talked to Cypress Hills Development Corporation, who was interested in entering this space. I don't know whether they're they're still interested. You know, there are real concerns because, you know, the Navy Yard yeah. has ruled our growth with $250 million of debt, private debt. Right. We have on. That's a real concern for a nonprofit to, to do that. But I do think that there's an opportunity that, um, you know, brave entities will be able to take right now. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Uh, we'll now move to Councilmember Barron for questions. Time starts now. Thank you, yeah, so Councilmember. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to the panel, Mr. Seitzer, for being here to talk about the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I was able to be a part of that visit uh, to the Navy Yard, it was very inspirational and very informative as to what's actually going on in the Navy Yard. Uh, it's very dear to me because I grew up in what was then called the Fort Greene Projects, which is literally a block up on Park Avenue from where the Navy Yard is located. And my dad, in fact, worked as a ship painter in a part of the 1950s when it was a real Navy Yard, a fully functioning Navy Yard. Um, I have a couple of questions. Can you just talk, you just spoke about $250, $250 million debt. Can you expand upon that a little more so that I can understand what that is? Um, yeah, so that's debt that we as the nonprofit have taken. Um, it sits on our balance sheet. It's not an obligation of the city of New York. And we use that to um, add space to the yard um, over the last 
uh, five or so years, we've added two and a half million square feet of industrial and manufacturing space to the yard, which is the equivalent of one World Trade Center. So we put our own equity in um, to that, but a large part of the capital that allows for that constru those construction projects is, is debt. Um, and uh, so, so that's where it comes from. So what impact that does that have on small, on smaller uh, entities that might have been thinking about that? How does that impact their consideration about moving there, being able to handle that? And what's, there, what do you charge per square foot if they want to come in? Yeah, um, good question. So this is a very, um, this is all art, no science on our part and a real balancing act. Um, we feel that we really do need to expand in order to add more jobs and to bring in more industrial companies who are, you know, otherwise at risk in New York City's real estate environment. Um, so we take debt to add space and that does create the need for us to pay a very large amount of debt service every year, but we're very aware that we have to keep rents affordable. Um, because if we expand so much and we take so much debt that then we have to charge more rent, why are we why are we doing it? It doesn't make sense. So we have not adjusted our rent structure. Well, let me, we have not adjusted our rent structure except for kind of annual, you know, every couple of years we take a look at it with our board. And the way we set rents at the yard is really what can manufacturers afford? We do not ask what market is. We share the same zoning as much of Dumbo and we do not charge the same as what Dumbo charges. We charge what we believe uh, uh, manufacturers can afford. And by that, I mean, not just barely afford, right? I think this is really important also in the context of the pandemic. We're giving rent abatements and forgiveness, not to like just the dollar to get the last dollar that our tenants can afford. We're making it so that they can afford to continue to invest in themselves, their people, their equipment and all that. So they're ready to grow. So when we set rents, um, we are setting them at levels where a company can move into a new space, pay us rent, but then also buy that next piece of equipment that allows them to win a new contract and, um, uh, and continue to expand themselves in their workforce. So, um, you know, rents vary to some extent based on the kind of building that you're in at the yard, um, but they're, they range from the high teens to the low twenties um, with the only exception of in some of our developments, um, we have small amounts of space that we earmark for office. Those office tenants, we charge very close to full market rents and that helps subsidize the manufacturers and the other small businesses that move into the building kind of downstairs. So in, in the instance where the uh, high school is there, the STEAM high school, uh, is that space that's being rented by the Department of Education for that program, which is a great program. Very um, Yeah, very thank you. And, um, and I would say in terms of lessons for economic development, I'm a real believer in, um, in, in that. That is now a labor of love of mine. Um, uh, and I think that that model of co-locating education, both CUNY, we're working very hard to get CUNY, more CUNY campuses um, at the Navy Yard. Um, and high schools co-located with these kinds of businesses is really um, is really important. There's a kind of common phrase: you can't you can't be what you've never seen. And getting young students in an environment where they're seeing, you know, folks in the media industry or robotics or engineering and can imagine themselves in that, and also, frankly, just being taken seriously as students um, is, I think, extraordinarily powerful. And I, I've yet to do a tour of anybody as a who don't come across as like. Um, as you know, fully fully on board with the model. Um, so, but to answer your question, so the DOE does pay some rent again, way below market because we really wanted to see that uh, project happen. Um, but they do pay us uh, a relatively modest rent. I would say that we um, we have subsidized the Steam Center pretty dramatically um, in order to get the model up and running. It's a brand new model. It required a lot of work, a lot of thinking about how uh, the curriculums were going to be developed, the physical space, et cetera, et cetera. So the Navy Yard itself off our own balance sheet, um, last I did the calculation, has contributed well over $2 million to the development of, of the concept. And then finally, Mr. Chair, if I may, one final question. Um, 
you've mentioned CUNY and we know that the film school is located mm -hmm. in the Navy Yard. And I think I heard you mention some other kinds of partnerships that you have with CUNY. If you could just give us some information about that. Sure. Um, so there are quite a few. I'll probably forget some of them. Um, but we are, um, we partner with Medgar Evers. Uh, Medgar was the um, Startup New York designee for that state program. Uh, we structured an uh, arrangement with them basically where, uh, I'm, I'm going to overstate it a little bit, but the entire Navy Yard becomes part of, is potentially part of their campus. So we've struck a, struck a deal where any Startup New York company that approaches Medgar Evers um, can find space in the Navy Yard and um, is automatically kind of tied into that program and all of the hoops that you have to jump through to get through that program are taken care of for them already in large part. Um, we partner with LaGuardia Community College, who's now um, uh, starting to do some trainings um, at the Navy Yard for our incumbent workers. Uh, actually I actually have a conversation with them next week, I believe, about furthering that. Um, uh, our largest partnerships really come to, uh, are with um, City Tech, which is, of course, mm -hmm. three or four blocks away. Um, we are constantly having conversations with them on various fronts about, about partnerships. My, frankly, my ultimate goal is that they open a part of their campus at the Navy Yard. Um, we're not there yet um, by any stretch of the imagination, but we've been having those conversations. Um, but the main focus of that partnership is around the internship program, which is, I think, extraordinarily impactful. Um, we take about 150 interns every year, place them, we pay for the summer stipends, we place them into the companies at the yard. Um, this is to what I was talking about with, with Brad. You know, our companies, when they, they're often founded by MIT, Harvard, Columbia, et cetera, graduates. Um, and we make it as easy as possible for them to find talent locally. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to interns, we pay for the summer stipends of a CUNY student. And what we found is that that primes the pump and develops a relationship between the company and CUNY that we then no longer need to subsidize. Um, we at this point have, I, I think it's three students from City Tech who came through the yard, worked with a, one of our robotics companies and now work for NASA. It's anecdotal, but we see those kinds of stories constantly. And those companies who, you know, one of those companies is Honeybee Robotics, which has had robotics on every Mars rover since 2003. Um, and, you know, frankly, city tech students are not their normal hire, to be honest about it. Um, but they've now developed a direct relationship with the engineering department at city tech because they've realized what I think we know is that the city tech students are well positioned for these jobs. They're hungry. They are extraordinarily diligent and hard workers. They walk to work. So they're not going back to Boston or San Francisco at the end of the year. And the value proposition becomes clear. We just need to give that impetus. If I could squeeze in one more quick question. What is the percentage of Black and Latinos that you have uh, in your corporation itself that's overseeing the Navy Yard and that are tenants there? Um, so our staff is majority minority. Um, I don't have the exact percentage, um, but I think we've built over the years a exceptionally diverse staff. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but it's certainly uh, well more than 50%. Um, and that um, is up and down the organization. Our, our management committee is, 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 I think, quite diverse, not quite as diverse as the staff overall, and that's something that we are working on. Um, I would say one area that we are um, have, have been working very hard on and have made progress on is in our direct real estate functions. It may not be come as a surprise to the Economic Development Committee that New York City commercial real estate is not the most diverse uh, industry in anywhere. Um, and so um, we are developing programs to nurture that talent as opposed to just go out and kind of do a standard recruitment, which then, then you know, is it, challenging to find diverse candidates. Um, but we are developing explicit programs. In terms of our tenant base, hold on, I have that somewhere. Um, 
Um, um, Donna, do you have the number? I do. Um, uh, so we have um, our companies are broken down between master tenants. So basically people that have a direct relationship with us. And then we have many um, minority owned businesses. And that's the rubric that we, or that's the metric that we look at. Um, not just um, a diverse person within the workforce, but a business that is owned, um, uh, that is minority owned. Um, so, so our numbers, as far as our, our latest count, and these, do, these numbers do change, um, is that just in the master tenancies, we have 130 MWBE tenants uh, of the 309. And if you include subs, that number goes to 145. Um, that it makes, the subs, yeah the subs are inaccurate because we don't have perfect information about all the subtenants within the yard unfortunately because they're not their contract isn't directly with us so i think the most accurate one is the direct which is 100 and um 130 out of 309 this is though um council member an area of concern for us to be um honest uh we have looked at the demographics a lot of those are women-owned businesses we have a lot of minority-owned businesses and black-owned businesses but it is not as diverse as we would like to see um and that is why um about a year and a half ago we started working on the equity incubator which is a um which is a small business incubator uh focused on minority-owned businesses and with a particular focus on black-owned businesses um, we were getting ready to release the RFP when COVID hit. And so we put pa pushed pause because we didn't know, you know, it was impossible time for people to ask people to come up with new ideas and, and right. um, raise new money. Uh, we've just re released that RFP um, this month. We'll be getting responses back in January. Um, and the concept is to have a physical space and a set of programs that are tailored to um, to supporting small businesses yeah. with equity at their heart. That Thank may, there are models where that means that they're solely focused on um, MBEs. There are some that are solely focused on black owned businesses. Okay. At this point, we are agnostic on that. And we've just asked the nonprofits and social entrepreneurs out there, you tell us your ideas. We want to hear all the ideas and then we will go through a process. Um, well, maybe David, when thank you get you. the results back of that. Please. Thank you so much. And I know I've over exceeded my time and I thank you for indul your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And I'm leaving because I'm at another hearing as well. Well, we love you, Inez. Don't worry. Thank you. Have a, have a best point. day. So Stay we, safe. So what we can do, David, is maybe when the RFP starts coming back in January, that would be great information to pass it on the panel. Yeah, absolutely. It will probably will not be January. It'll take us some time to go through the process and to understand what we have, but yeah, sometime okay. early in the year. Some of the, um, Alex, do we have any other council members have questions? Um, at the moment, we do not, although we anticipate there might be another one in a minute. So why don't we have a second round so of questions you, from the chair? Yeah, but David, I, I always like to go, I guess that's the, the past, my past uh, tutelage is going through the testimony. You had great stuff there in the Navy on tenant support section. Um, and I think that actually can be emulated and followed in many other places. So you put um, our rent deferral and abatement program is to our knowledge, the most generous in the city among commercial landlords. And I would tend to think you're right. So I'll give you a minute to explain how you're doing that because one of the challenges we're doing as council members is how do we get through this financial crisis that the pandemic has created along with other things and the, the landlords just do not have if the tenants aren't paying and the landlords don't have it and then you have rent and then you have city bills that are coming due that aren't being reduced on a city level and that's what we're calling what i'm calling for that reduction i think this is the type of model that we could put if we, our team efforts help the art companies stabilize themselves and cope with these financial challenges um with training and technical assistance sessions so if you can just kind of guide us through how that how that's worked and as a result of those efforts have you been able to sustain most, if not all of your tenants. Yeah. Um, so, um, so in terms of rent forgiveness, I mean, this is very hard um, for, I think, legislatively, to be honest. Um, I'm not a legislator, but you know, we have a committee of um, probably nearly 10 people who meet every week 
um, including all of our executive vice presidents. So our chief financial officer, Johanna, our chief development officer, our chief operating officer, and our general counsel um, to discuss on a tenant by tenant basis. We have a board approved regime, which abates rent and then um, requires the tenants begin repaying some of that abatement, I'm sorry, some of that deferral. But then if they pay back some of the deferral, we then abate the remainder. So it's a way of kind of saying, look, if you know, we'll work with you, but you know, we got to make payroll, we got to make our pay our debt service rolls, the banks take possession of the Navy Yard, which obviously will never happen, but obviously we can't ever uh, even flirt with that. Uh, and so we need tenants to pay rent um, and we've got to have that. Uh, so it's a way of um, aligning incentives where, you know, you work with us, we'll work with you. So where um, are you at the occupancy levels now? So if you are um, where you were from March until now, are you able to sustain? Yeah. Or so I think we've, um, if, I, I, I think we've done exceptionally well here. Um, we have had seven tenants close since March. All of those, when we talked to them, said, look, I'm at retirement age and defer rent deferral or abatement beside this is the crisis I'm just not going to dig out of, right? Because it is heartbreaking and exhausting for tenants to, to rebuild their businesses after a downturn, even if they have a, a landlord who's charging them no rent, which we couldn't do. And so they decided that this was the time to retire and they did not have a, a logical um, person to hand the, hand the company off to. Um, so at this moment, we've lost only seven tenants out of um, you know over 400. Um, I think we will see a few more close, unfortunately. Um, we have taken we've taken the position that um, pretty much anything we can do to get our tenants through this, we we will do. But if a tenant did not have a particularly sustainable business before this, and just can't pay rent now and has no ability in the future to pay rent, then at some point you've got to, you've got to move on. So um, you see a change, hard, maybe with that, with that change of economic realities that we're in, have any new tenants then taken advantage of the new needs that yeah, Dawn has created basically? I mean, there's, there's unfortunately creates, with a crisis creates new opportunities for those who can capitalize. Absolutely. Yeah, we've uh, we've signed a number of new leases. Uh, we continue to negotiate and sign leases. That's partially because there is opportunity in crisis. It's partially because you know when we have space, tenants want to move into the Navy Yard because we're a safe harbor. Um, but we also certainly have tenants that are growing, and that's one thing I would just say about the legislation. Just my humble opinion, my two cents here. I think the challenge legislatively is that we have small business tenants who can and should pay full rent period, full stop. Um, and, you know, that takes a different couple different flavors. We've got one who we have been in a very extended um, negotiation, I guess I would call it with, where, you know, the, found, the owners of the company are, you know, worth nine figures, each of them. And they've been withholding rent. And what they're doing is withholding rent from a nonprofit and they don't need to, and they can afford to pay rent. And that's the position we've taken, which is, we, you know, yeah, you're a small business. We don't care, pay your rent. I think legislatively how you, uh, how, you know, cause again, like that's just goes to how many interns can we afford to support from CUNY next year? And I'll be damned if I'm gonna pick the, you know, company that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars over the CUNY students, that's never gonna happen. So, how you balance that legislatively is very difficult. Something that we've said um, to other legislators who have asked, the, asked our opinion is that, you know, one way to do that is at least to carve out nonprofits. And there are a lot of nonprofits, the Fifth Avenue Committee, bed Restoration, Wedco, um, Greater Jamaica, who rely on their real estate to fund their mission. And if you trust them to work with their tenants, which we all are, then I think they can be exempted from the legislation like that so you're in a position where you're picking a for-profit company over a nonprofit's mission. But you also don't have to do something. And I, and I, what we, what I've always done, is just, whatever the bill may be, you know, separate from today, it doesn't have to be a forever. You know, this can be a temporary 
pandemic crisis financial deal where for a year upon year in the sunset and look at it, maybe you do give. I love uh, what you just said, that nonprofit flexibility to be able to foster and handle those relationships themselves and maybe do take a little bit less for the overall gain that we're keeping those jobs and keeping the, company, the city, the extent, the place to go. So yeah, no legislation should ever hinder that, you know, um, especially something like this. This is just a, a what the year or annual quarter, however you really want to set it up, um, transfer of that information. Because uh, in all honesty, it's just now as we, are, most of the council members are coming down to the last part of that segment, is how can we leave this committee better for the next four? And what were some of the challenges that we had to face when we took in? And honestly, when the, the wonderful ride I've been on on this committee is just where the visiting places and learning these gems throughout the city, um, none of that was ever really kind of known. And it was just kind of assumed that you just kind of went through and let UDC and give that testimony. And then we, we meet folks like you who are doing such wonderful things. And you want to be able to just say, look, look how they made this work. And maybe use that formula to help out. Members. I don't want you to look at anything, especially in a bill that's really just a data information to hinder your ability to run on that. I would never do that. In fact, like when we deal with New York and Company, and we, we, we've gone back and forth on similar issues, and we've, we've pulled back on some of the legislation or changed it or to make sure that they weren't hindered in any way, because we don't want to do that to Fred Dixon either or any of the groups. You know, you're, you're, but there's a, something on our end that we need to be able to have something substantial so that we can see, okay, look at the, look at the work, look how they pivoted during the pandemic. Um, yeah, so they would never take the level of getting into negotiations between you and the Senate. So you, the master plan, though, so I guess since we're talking about how you're altering your vision through going through all this, do you see any changes because of what we're going through in these last six months, or do you think you're comfortable that we can still go forward? Um, well, we certainly believe that we need to continue to go forward with the master plan for sure. Again, the um, last nine months to us has really been ex an extreme lesson in the importance of the Navy Yards model and the importance of, you know, uh, local production and local high tech production in particular. So we're, you know, if it's possible, we're more committed to executing the master plan. On timing, um, like I said, you know, we stopped our lawyers and ur urban planners work at the beginning of the pandemic because of our own cash flow concerns. So there is a timing question about the Mueller. Um, in terms of the actual development of the buildings, um, I think that is to be determined. We have delivered over the last year, we delivered about 500,000 square feet of new manufacturing space to the yard. Um, we had certain assumptions about how quickly that would lease up. And while we are still signing new leases, and there are actually a couple of very exciting leases that we may be signing soon, um, that has slowed down a bit. Um, we, it's yet to be determined how, how much of that slowdown, will, how, how long that slowdown will last. Obviously, we will not want to build another building while we're still trying to lease up this 500,000 square feet of space. So, so no. maybe, maybe, you know, right where you are, keep that thought, because I know Council Member Levin has, has just come on and I'm looking at him and I know he's uh, master tasking between family planning and the rest. So I want right. to give you a chance there to, uh, to to speak while we have. So Council Member Levin, if you want to jump in on your questions and then I'll go I'll continue on. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ehrenberg. I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to just uh, say a few words. I'm, I'm, uh, I had, my car battery died, so I had to get a jump um, and pick my kid up from our class. So uh, anyway, I, um, I just want to just actually just express my uh, appreciation to the Navy Yard, um, to David and his and his staff. Um, uh, they've been a, an exceptional uh, partner uh, to New York City government. Um, for the last 20 years. Um, and um, uh, first under Andrew Kimball's stewardship and, and in, in recent years under David's stewardship, um, where um, it's, a, you know, it's showing how to do economic development right. Um, uh, there are a lot of kind of uh, 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 
advantages that the Navy Yard has um, that don't necessarily translate to other other parts of the city, but there are there are uh, aspects of the Navy Yard that could be adapted um, <clears throat> either to other uh, areas, um, IBZs, um, uh, industrial areas, um, uh, you know, throughout uh, throughout the city, um, and it it has the great benefit of being um, uh, you know a mission driven and not not for profit. Um, and can invest back into um, uh, the businesses that are that are in um, that are in the yard, and so, um, and I, th I think I speak for uh, elected representatives uh, up and down, um, you know, our, our 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 system. So state and federal representatives, we all um, uh, stay very close uh, contact with with David and his staff. So. Um, I just want to, um, again, express my appreciation and, and knowing that these are really uncertain times for small businesses, um, really difficult times for small businesses. And so the idea that the Navy Yard has been, has been uh, there as a, um, you know, if, when we talk about what small businesses are surviving and which ones are, are not at this time during COVID, um, uh, who the landlord is is a very important um, part of that equation, and um, the fact that the Navy Yard is there for so many of their their tenants is um, is is a, is is one important aspect of ensuring that they survive um, and and eventually are able to get back really on their feet. So um, again, just want to thank David for for uh, for the work that he and his staff have done, and uh, I want to thank uh, the chair for having this hearing. Council Member Levin, we are all very uh, jealous <laughs> that you get to have this wonderful in your district relationship then, and it is really a model. Um, I could only imagine if we could bring something like that to College Point, not even to flush it. So, um, and while it's while it's in while it's technically in my district, um, we've always shared uh, the Navy Yard, uh, the 33rd and the 35th district as well. So, um, uh, uh, our Attorney General. Uh, Letitia James was, uh, you know, very dedicated to the yard during her tenure, as is um, our current uh, colleague and majority leader, Lori Combo. Well, you be safe. If you need any help with the jumping of the car, we... yeah, we're all good. AAA came out. <laughs> we will send the crew. Some rust back. issues, but it's. I think we're all right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So David, you were doing the uh, some changes to the master plan. We just talking about the possibility. Um, yeah. So I want to wrap that part up. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just the obvious statement that the economics to some extent have changed. Um, so we'll have to see in the next year or so how much of that space we we lease up because we will not want to start construction or development on a new building until we're very very far through leasing that existing five hundred thousand square feet. There is to some extent a an unknown there because you know when and if we find an anchor tenant for the manufacturing space in those buildings, we will want to move as quickly as possible. And it, that is independent to some extent of, of the current downturn. We have large tenants at the yard who are taking more space because their, their business is not directly affected by the pandemic. So if one of, those need, one of them needed 100,000 square feet and we could build it for them, uh, we'd want to do it, which is why we're eager to complete the ULERP so we have that in hand and can then Move to move to construction quickly if a large where manufacturer you, shows up. Um, we are, um, like I said, we paused it at the beginning of Euler. Uh, sorry, at the beginning of COVID because of um, just the lawyer bills. Um, so we have now, uh, so we are prepared to restart that, and we're talking to the administration. Uh, just about the timing and, you know, DCP's got a lot going on. So we're trying to figure out the bandwidth and when we can slot back in. Well, if, and again, that's where we say how we could be an assistance. I think you have a, a, a council member crew here that is fully on board. So if you, you have our time together, it might be something that we can help because we have full knowledge of the work that you're doing. So if we can help in any way uh, to support that, because nowadays any type of zoning application creates a mini firestorm everywhere so yep. and it's just it turns into something because outside sources come in and create 
an issue that's not what's local. So having your local story to defend against that, we'd be happy to help. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I think um, uh, we we appreciate that. We've communicated that to um, to the administration. I think they know it anyway. But excuse me, I will I'll, I'll reaffirm that. Is there any? I know with when you had the master plan and then you had the billion dollar expansion. I guess that's kind of all intertwined. Yep. Yep. Or is, it, is there any part of the expansion that's also been kind of put on hold, or are we all? No, no. The expansion really is our current work which will take us up to 20,000 jobs and that all those construction projects are done and they just need to lease up um, for us to hit that 20,000 jobs. So that's not changing at all. The next phase, all, everything about the next phase requires the ULERP um, because if we don't have the ULERP, we have to build an absurd amount of parking uh, and an absurd amount of truck loading bays, which is unwise for us and we think unwise for the local community because it's just drawing more traffic rather than less. So this ULERP is, will, will, will be interesting because it's actually about reducing traffic, it's about reducing truck utilization um, rather, than, rather than increasing. We're not asking for more density, we're not asking for more bulk, all we're asking is to reduce the number of cars and trucks. Let's see, that sounds like such Maybe. a horrible thing to ask. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You want to reduce the commercial traffic footprint in the neighborhood? This is horrible. We have had battling that in College Point um, as different, one of the few areas within industrial zones and nonprofits and city agencies all kind of intermix a bunch of residential housing. And that's always the, the, the balance is reducing the amount of commercial traffic in that these just naturally generate and the waterfront that you have. So is is one of the areas of expansion of the use of the waterfront to offset some of that commercial traffic or is that just a separate? Um, so, so that's a very good question. Um, you know, we have an active ship repair facility at the yard, which takes up the vast majority of our, of our waterfront. Um, and they are, they are expanding. We are, um, going through a multi-decade, frankly, process of uh, improving the bulkheads and piers and the like. And as we do that, they move back in and, um, and can win more contracts and do more work. Um, at this point, the master plan buildings um, are, need to be flexible enough that they would allow for that, that use and that connection to the waterfront. Um, so, you know, we, there's the state RFP for um, off, um, offshore wind. We are one of the um, locations that are identified in the RFP as a potential, um, as a potential site for some of that activity. Um, that would largely be around um, the kind of the ships that have to go back and forth and repairing and potentially building some of those ships, et cetera, et cetera. If we found an anchor tenant who wanted to do something like that in one of our master plan buildings and needed a connection to the waterfront, we need the flexibility in the ULERP to allow that to happen. So let's make sure you include that because that right. is, you know, we have a waterfront district ourselves and, and there has been so much inability to access that over just, not so much even misuse, it's just kind of decades, like you said, of just people kind of forget about these wonderful areas that can turn into community joint partnerships with the use of parking walkways and have actually ships take away from the trucks coming into the street. And you know, there's that balance that we can really, really tap, tap into. So that'd be another one we'd have to help with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that balance is, again, to some extent, like we're not gonna be able to specify it pre precisely in the ULERP because we don't know whether it's a ship builder that's gonna want, a, want space or, you know, somebody building the blades of the turbines or something entirely different. And so, um, part of the ULERP will be making sure that, um, that that flexibility is preserved. You know, when you took us through on that great tour, you were showing us some of the buildings. Um, I, I hope we do get to get, come back one more time. Mm -hmm. right? There's the whole ferry experience over the city hall over you and showing folks how easy that is. Uh, it was an eye opening. You, a couple of the buildings, I just, they said it was like 127 and 303 that you were kind of working on or they were fully open it. How, how are those? Are they all done? Yeah. So um, 127 is, uh, it, both, both are now complete. 
Um, one twenty-seven. We actually got the TCO in the middle of COVID during the pause. Um, our team did an extraordinary job making sure that that happened because we were ta- we were using tax credits that if we weren't able to complete the project during the pause, we would have paid huge penalties um, to, um, to to bank. Um, so that got its TCO. We are in late stage negotiations with two tenants to take half half of the space. We don't haven't signed leases yet, but we're we have the term sheets and the leases are out and they've gone back and forth a couple of times and we're expecting to sign in the next couple of weeks, maybe month, maybe a month or two. Um, so delivering a building that's a relatively large building, it's hundred thousand square feet. Um, delivering a building during COVID and having it fifty percent leased almost immediately, I think is again, a testament to how much this kind of space is needed. Um, And then uh, in 303, that's also been completed. um, And we are, those are smaller units and we are signing leases that again, has certainly slowed down. Small businesses are are, are to a large extent waiting and seeing, Um, but we, are getting we are getting leases signed with you know real manufacturers in that building and our expectation is that again when we get through this winter and perhaps early spring and there is a there's a vaccine out in the market that those companies that have survived will all of a sudden see the logic of um uh you know of moving <laughs> And moving into the yard and moving in general and sl- cementing their um, uh, their space, and so we're we're expecting that in the coming months we'll see a lot more activity there. Well, I think that um, how we started the hearing with telling us how you could survive through the pandemic and how you pivoted to providing the PPE equipment and what we needed here, and knowing that you have that ability to turn that back on as the uncertainties of the winter months come yeah. upon us. Uh, was very uh, relief to all of us to know that that backup is in place and that's what we didn't have in March. So that yep. to me, no, knowing or not knowing what's coming, knowing that you're there and with EDC and the partnerships that are in place to turn that engine back on is so critical. So um, Alex, our council, I saw a council member in the chat is on. Did you, Carlos, did you want to uh, have any questions before we wrap up? Perfect. Go for it. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee staff and and David. Good to see you. Um, it's been it's been a while since we've we've sat in rooms, but we were in rooms intensely uh, during and up into the ramp up of the industry city conversation. And so I want to thank you and your team for really opening up opening up the doors to the Navy Yard. Um, the Navy Yard is not a stranger to me. I was the uh, capital budget and economic director for Marty Markowitz. And so the Navy Yard is a place where I've, I've kind of seen grow and believe in it. Um, I will, I, I'm going to offer a couple comments and then, and then end with a question. I think the Navy Yard has become this really interesting thing when you look at mayoral uh, intentions and they, and it kind of, it's felt like a, almost like a pet project. Like, oh, this is a really interesting thing. Let's support it. Um, but what I think what I just heard you in today's testimony and back and forth with council members that it's more than in just this like siloed experience, this could really be a massive modeling uh, for for the engine to start again for economic uh, repair of our of our city. And and I'm now kind of thinking about Sunset Park and the battles that we were having from the very beginning in Sunset Park about really thinking about the the assets in in Sunset Park, the city owned assets and really creating almost like a Navy Yard in Sunset Park. That, that, that those words were fighting words for EDC because they, they, they sure as hell don't want to let go of that property because it is incredibly lucrative. Uh, it brings in a lot of, of, um, of profit to this organization, the EDC. And so my question to you as we as we discuss these questions of, of like understanding the model, getting more reporting from you, getting a sense of like how it actually works. Uh, my, my question to you is how do we think about private sector uh, ideas like Industry City that really fail to, to make the case for these kind of um, uh, campuses uh, and 
and really looking at the Navy Yard as a way to kind of uh, understand how, how, we, how we approach other city owned properties on the waterfront that have access to the water um, that, that, that can be engines of, of economic opportunity and, and really expand the Navy Yard across the city. And, and so what elements are, are needed? And I'll, I'll, I'll probe you a little bit with the concept of, of just incredible subsidy. This can't work without subsidy. You can't, you can't do what you do. And so that's okay. And I think that there's been some pre previous mayoral uh, attitudes that, that, that that's not okay. But look at all the beautiful things that you've offered the city of New York with incredible subsidy, public funds for the public good. And that's been something I think that many administrations, including the EDC, I think are still struggling with. And look at how we're celebrating, we've been celebrating you for over, over two hours now. Um, this is no longer a pet project. I think this needs to become a centerpiece for future administrations. So maybe you can kind of comment on that uh, as a... Yeah, so I'll, I'll, no pressure, David. It's the it's the backbone for all future administrations. Right. right. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I'm trying to keep my comments kind of focused on the Navy Yard because, um, you know, I, I was at EDC, but I haven't been there for eight years, and um, and and wouldn't feel comfortable commenting on on their assets. But I think you know the Navy Yard is a special case. Um, we have this extraordinary asset. I mean, I will tell you when I was appointed by Bloomberg and reappointed by, by de Blasio. And when I got reappointed by de Blasio, I said, you know, Mr. Mayor, we have 300 acres on the Brooklyn waterfront. If we're not doing something really amazing in the next couple of years, you should definitely fire me because that yeah. would be excusable. So we have this extraordinary asset and you really can't lose track of that, that that gives us an extraordinary amount of flexibility to, um, to execute the mission. We tried to do that in no small part by, by being an experiment ground, by creating models that we do think at least in part, and a piece here, a piece there, can, re can be replicated elsewhere. Um, I, I really truly believe that the STEAM Center is something that in public sites or private sites can and should be replicated. Um, that I'm comfortable saying. I believe you and I saw that and I'm a believer and I wanted it in Sunset Park. Uh, it just didn't, it didn't excite the administration. Um, so, well, I think the administration is a real believer in some, in, in the steam center. I can't speak to um, speak to the, um, to the dynamics in Sunset Park, but that model, again, I mean, we have not taken a, uh, a lay person, a local elected official or a education expert through that space without them saying, this is, you know, this is the model. Um, and we are now actively working on um, developing a uh, program toolkit, whatever you call it, to help other locations, either in the city or, um, or in, in the rest of the country, to replicate the STEAM Center. And, you know, the logic of it is extraordinarily simple. Um, career, I think there are two pieces of it, that career and technical education should not and cannot continue to be um, thought of the way it's been thought of as a dumping ground for those who won't pass the Regents exams. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's never been true. Um, the same centered students pass all the regions classes and they're doing more. Um, and that career and technical education is important that, you know, you've got college, high school students who are soon going to be in the workforce and they, they need those skills um, and that they want those skills and that, you know, like I'll take myself as an example. I distinctly remember sitting in high, high school and I went to Stuyvesant, sitting in high school in the back of my history class and zoning out because we were talking about king something or another in England. Mm. And the teacher calling on me and being like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not paying attention. And I wasn't paying attention because I didn't care. <laughs> and I shouldn't have cared. <laughs> I wasn't going to be a history professor. And it was a waste of my time. And I knew it. And high school students are smart enough to know when the adults in their lives are wasting their time. When you tell a student to sit behind a desk and read this book, because I'm telling you to read this book, even though it has nothing to do with your life, they know it. And it, it affects their performance in that class and it affects their agency in the rest of their life because you're stripping them of agency. And that's all 
a young adult wants is agency. As opposed to you say, oh, you're interested in cybersecurity? Okay, here's a textbook. Read the, read the textbook. What's wrong with reading a textbook on cybersecurity or not a textbook, right? Like an article about cybersecurity. Why is that worse than reading Jane Eyre? Mm. Your literacy mm. class. I, I'm with you. Possibly wrong. So anyway, like, like I said, this is a labor of love and I really care about it. So, and the other logic of it is that if you're going to do that, you have to do it co-located with business. That you cannot do it in the basement of a high school in a residential area, um, you know, somewhere in one of the boroughs. It just, it is not going to work. The students are going to know it's not real. You're not going to get the feedback loops that you need with private industry and you're not going to get the feed and you're not going to get the buy-in. What we found is that like we put the steam center intentionally in our largest building that we had just spent $200 million on, right? No landlord does that, puts a high school in the middle of their marquee building and instantaneously every tenant in the building loves it, loves it, loves it, loves it. Um, it's like one of the draws for the building now. I mean, it's, the building's fully leased, but it's like one of the marketing draws. It's like, you can be co-located with this high school. Um, so in, you know, private industry wants to do this stuff. It just needs, it, it needs government to, um, to do its part. Um, so I think the STEAM Center is one thing that certainly could be, um, could be modeled uh, and replicated in other major economic development initiatives. And it's something we've talked to the administration about. You know, the rest of it is, is, is hard to comment on because we do have this extraordinary asset. I do think that, you know, part of the model is that I and Joanna, not, not for the last couple of months, but, you know, go to the yard every day. And that intimacy that, you know, God bless them, my tenants, I've probably gotten four or five emails from them. So I know everything that's going wrong at the Navy Yard. Um, and that level of intensive stewardship um, is certainly a, a major part of our model, um, you know, and we've accumulated a really amazing team. And when they're on site and there's a problem, they're going to fix it just because they, they got to fix it, right? Like it's who they are. Um, so, and that's true with our workforce development team where it's like, you know, we, we're just a, we're in it. We're like imbued in it. And so it's a constant, it's actually a constant challenge to figure out what we're not going to do because we generate so many ideas and we can't possibly execute them all. That's more the problem um, than anything else. So, you know, there are elements of our model, I think that can be taken elsewhere, but, um, but we are very, we are very unique. Um, and to um, Steve's point, you there know, are- David Carlos, I'm gonna jump in on, on that because Carlos, I agree with you 100% on that. You know, so the, the challenge then becomes, right? Since you have a successful model, so many different districts, and that's where the council members can be best, are, are not comprised of that type of setup, or maybe don't have the ability to have a large building to house the steam center. So then we have to go to the next level of how do you connect to those communities? And it's through pilot programs and connecting out to a community that may not have that resource to get those students excited about there is a job right here in New York City. And yes, it may not go the traditional educational path, and you can do it. And now all of a sudden you're, you're bringing that excitement to those tendrils can go right out to districts. So I, I say that because my district is a very, very large district that doesn't have any of that type of uh, infrastructure to do that. So we work with schools, like you said, unfortunately, with a basement or something that can get the kids a pilot program to you. So they know there's that hope the light at the end of the tunnel. So it's- And, and let me just clarify- what growing what Carlos was saying, this great, platform and then, then bringing it so that if there is any type of expansion project, whether it's small or large, that at any level there should be a STEAM educational component immediately to it so that it can connect immediately to this hub that what Carlos is talking about, the future how we're going to generate right. students. And let me clarify one thing about that's the STEAM. Exciting. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the next challenge. That's, that's the stuff that reason why we come to work and they say, okay, let's let's do that. That's the yeah. right. Sure. Let me clarify one thing about the Steam Center. We actually are that tendril. It is the tendril model. So the Steam Center is located at the Navy Yard, but there are eight high schools that send students, and those high schools go um, all throughout Central Brooklyn um, and include some of the higher performing schools and some of the lower performing schools. So there are students who are east of their home high school and are like in East Flatbush and come to come to the Navy Yard um, every day. 
Uh, so I think it is possible and you know, are in residential neighborhoods and the high schools in residential neighborhoods, but for the part of the day that they're in the CTE classes, they, they come to a co-located a facility co-located with business. And again, I just want to say this is this is not about tracking students into working with your hands. Um, most of our students have gone on to college. The vast majority of the students at the STEAM Center have gone on to college. A higher percentage of the STEAM Center students have gone to college than from their home high school. And we're not, and we're not creaming. Uh, so it's about engaging the students and expecting them to do more. Some of them will work through college in construction or cybersecurity or what have you. But what we are definitely finding is that if you expect more of the students and you connect it to the real world, they do more and they do more happily. The principal actually had to implement, he closes the school at six and he has to throw the kids out. I remember that. When we were at the core, we, we, like, were, we hanging out there doing like personal projects. They don't leave. That is not normal high school. <laughs> oh, do you want to close this out with one last question? Or? No, that I just want to say thank you. This is a great conversation. I know we're going to continue having it. And I, I think it's the um, the beginnings of this next chapter that we're building and it's happening at the Navy Yard. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And uh, one last check with our committee council. Any other questions or panels that may have come in? Chair, seeing that there are uh, no public members who have uh, signed up to testify, uh, I guess I'll just turn it back to you for closing remarks. So one thing we definitely have in common, David, is amazing staff around us. Uh, and that's how we can prepare. So Joanna, you, you're, you've got a great team there. And it's clearly, as you can see from a council member, whether we're in Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island, um, everyone looks at this model as to what they want to bring. So um, I wanted to give you that format today to expand upon our visit so that we could do that. Um, one of the staff that I am uh, lucky to have, to have joined our office in the last year, just we just promoted him to our legislative director at council is Kevin Kopofsky. So Kevin, if you're watching and looking, thank you for preparing for this uh, and getting the questions and for the team, for Alex and Emily and Aaliyah. Uh, and Jonathan Ahmed, we thank you all. Uh, another great hearing for us to go to to look forward to and give us a little hope with what's coming <clears throat> with these months. So you know that the city and there are nonprofits and groups ready to pivot when they are ready to need to produce additional medical equipment for us. Uh, and we're very thankful for that. So everyone have a blessed, healthy, and happy Thanksgiving. And with that, we close today's hearing. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much.